Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our special session of the Healthcare Committee of the Bay Area Council. And today's uh, title is the Bay Area Impact uh, on Will Delta Derail Our Reopening? We're really excited to uh, have you join us this morning. I'm Dr. Bill Eisenberg. I'm the Chief Quality and Safety Officer from Sutter Health, and I'm the co-chair of this Healthcare Committee. Today, we're delighted to have with us two special guests, two very special guests. Dr. Monica Gandhi, uh, who's a professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, Dr. Gandhi has a, has a lengthy, lengthy resume, um, but she is very specially um, engaged with us this morning because of her expertise in infectious diseases, worldwide infectious diseases. Uh, while she has a specialty in HIV, she uh, is a, really a master of all global medicine, especially in the infectious disease space. Additionally, we have Dr. Carolyn Kurtz, who's joining us uh, from the California Department of Public Health. Although Dr. Kurtz's background is one where she has been overseeing the branch of nutrition, education, and obesity prevention, like many of us, she has been deputized in the face of COVID to take on new duties. So she's really been the program director of the COVID-19 local coordination team for the, for the CDPH. So we're really fortunate to have both of these uh, special guests with us today. And I'd like to kick it off um, with a presentation by Dr. Kurtz, who's going to read us in on what's going on um, from a statewide perspective. So Dr. Kurtz, would you like to take it away? Good morning, thank you so much. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, and uh, thank you so much for all the support on uh, getting this presentation together. So we can go ahead and uh, move to the next slide. So just to give an overview of what I'll be covering my um, brief um, presentation, uh, national and state data, some Delta virus data that we've been tracking in the state, um, and a couple of Bay Area epidemiological um, pieces of data. Um, really high level overview of the key interventions that have been implemented at the state and the local level, um, as well as the latest so far on masking guidance. Um, and then we do have some additional slides um, that will go out after this presentation um, to give some resources. So why don't we go ahead and get started. So just want to give an overview. So this is where we were June 6. This is a following um, color with CDC criteria for levels of transmission. I'm very proud to say that back then, June 6, California was one of two states that had very low transmission. Um, and you know, we were do this was the status as we embarked on June 15th in the reopening. As we moved to the next slide there. July 12th, you can see we moved to the moderate level. Um, there were definitely other um, states that also showed their increase in transmission levels. And then now we move to August 3rd. And right now, um, as you can see, this is not something that we're all familiar with, but just in a very short period of time, California is now um, in the, um, the high transmission, the substantial transmission. So really quick change in a, in a very short period of time. Um, moving to the next slide here. At the state level, we've been tracking um, the different uh, types of variants and um, by, by variant sequencing proportion, you can see that divided up by regions in California. And so each of these um, graphs show the Bay Area, the greater Sacramento, Rancho, uh, San Joaquin Valley, um, Southern California. And then the very last one in the bottom right is California. Um, and in yellow is the proportion of um, the virus that is the Delta virus. So you can see it's a very large proportion across all the regions and statewide. However, moving to the next slide, um, and then just giving an overview, sorry, taking a step back here, where we are as of August 4th, this is data coming from last night. Um, you know, we are getting closer to the 4 million mark of cases. It is an increase, we're at 18.3 um, cases per 100,000, um, you know, for a long time there. If going back to like the June, June dates there, we were under 1,000 cases per day. And as of yesterday's data, we're at 8,500 per day and, and trending up. Um, we're at 64,000 deaths in total, um, and with 54 that were just reported yesterday, also showing an uptick there. Um, test, volume, test positivity also was going up for, uh, for a while there. We were under 1%, which designated us with the blue criteria there for, for CDC, and um, we're seeing that increase as well. Um, but, you know, with the vaccines administered, we are at 44 million doses administered, and that is one plus dose. 
Um, so we are seeing some good news in that respect, um, but just wanted to give an overview of like our numbers that we're tracking. Moving to the next slide. Wanted to use the slides. So it's a very, very busy slide. Um, it has the seven day average of cases by episode, total hospitalization, total ICU, um, deaths by date of um, death, and also associated COVID per day as of August 3rd. Um, but this shows, um, just to give a visual cue of what um, the pandemic has looked like for the state throughout the course of the pandemic and to show where the surges were taking place. So you can see on like the far right-hand side, those represent um, the last summer surge. And in the middle, we're all really aware of the, the really um, uh, intense uh, winter surge. And then over on like the far right-hand corner, you're seeing the data as it's trending up um, we're nearing, for many of the regions and throughout California, um, the summer surge levels of last year. Um, we're really wanting to keep an eye on that because um, certainly we don't want to repeat of the winter surge. Now, we don't think that we're anywhere near that. However, um, given what it looked like um, back last summer, we can see we're getting, we're getting to that point, if not there, for some parts of the region. Um, but, you know, wanted to also put it in context in comparison to the winter surge. Um, and then those uh, those uh, horse, those lines up and down that uh, show the different um, times in which there were uh, percentage of vaccination by different age groups. And, you know, as vaccination rates have increased, the coverage rates have increased, we've been able to stave off, I think, um, you know, the earlier presence of this surge that we're um, entering into right now. So puts, just wanted to put it into some perspective. Moving into the next slide. Um, we are also tracking um, post-vaccination COVID-19 confirmed cases, hospitalizations and deaths. Again, very much understand a busy slide, but wanted to put this here for visual cue that even with the increase in the um, rates for cases, hospitalizations and deaths amongst the um, uh, amongst the unvaccinated, you can see amongst those that are vaccinated, it's the dotted line far below um, the rest, you know, so we have 21.3 million that are fully vaccinated as of August 1st. Um, and the post-vaccination cases, which has a very specific definition, meaning um, uh, a, a identified case um, greater than 14 days after full vaccination, we're at 0.2% that have been identified. And out of those 21,000 um, cases, 1,379 were hospitalized. Unfortunately, 119 um, did pass away. Wanting to putting some caveats on there that you know we know tracking of this type of data is difficult. It is complicated. Um, there is we do have some missing hospitalization data. There is also a lot of um, complexity in terms of disentangling um, the cause. Um, but wanted to give really the full effect and context that um, post vaccination rates are so much. It's so much lower um, than that. We still continue to say that vaccinations. Um, are the most effective way of staving off um, the intensity of this disease. So moving on to the next slide here, I wanted to kind of show a little bit of um, that same type of data by region and how that actually tracks. This one here shows, you know, for the Bay Area region, um, which is the orange um, graph on the orange line on the bottom, um, that uh, that the Bay Area consistently has had one of the lowest test positivities in the state. Um, but we are trend, we are seeing that upward trend, as you can see on the very end of the tail there. Moving on to the next one. So as we're tracking, um, you know, this uh, surge that we're entering into and um, the data overall with those that are vaccinated um, and unvaccinated, do you want to talk about the key interventions that the state does currently have in play? And, and this is the strategy that we have employed moving forward. It is a combination of both local and state level interventions. Um, as far as like the local interventions are concerned, it is comprised of what I describe as four main levers that local jurisdictions have employed. And they've employed that based on what's best for their population, divided up either racially, culturally diverse populations, linguistically diverse populations, or by geography, urban and large cities, small and dispersed communities, agricultural, um, really a recognition and a nod to how diverse and large our state is. Given that type of like um, distinguishment of different groupings, there were four levers that we are seeing come in play at the local level, um, increasing public awareness locally and amplifying education on the ground, 
We're seeing uh, local jurisdictions and partners implement encouraging vaccinations with locally designed events that are tailored to their community with local incentive programs that are a nice complement to the state incentive program. Also increasing vaccination site convenience through the launch of hyper convenient pop-up sites and mobile vaccine clinics. Um, again, a, a partnership with the state and the local resources in order to do so. And then lastly, ensuring vaccination accessibility by providing wraparound services um, such as transportation, language translation, extended hours, walk-in, et cetera. Um, wanted to really like highlight that these four levers and the different combinations of those levers are applied to the different types of jurisdictions in different ge geographic regions and populations throughout California. And what we're seeing at the state as part of our local partnership is different levels of success based on the different combinations or recipes per se. While that is happening locally, we continue to have the other part of what I consider a statewide intervention, which is like at the state level, continued statewide outreach and equity efforts. And within that is our statewide media campaign, um, which is now accompanied by a youth 12 plus campaign that re and reaching families. We're also leveraging partnerships with 40, for over 400 ethnic media outlets that cover 25 languages, including the indigenous languages. Um, other outreach and education efforts that are coordinated at the state level, um, get the Get Out the Vaccine phone bank and door knocking campaign, which coordinates with 70 community-based organizations, um, and so far has resulted in over 1.3 million conversations that promote vaccination via either personal phones or door-to-door -door interactions. Um, and certainly with an eye and a focus on our, um, our HPIQ1 communities. Um, California has also invested over $127 million to support over 500 community-based organizations for outreach and underserved communities. And a subset of these organizations are already um, working through uh, over 185,000 vaccine appointments, over 700,000 referrals. And so these things are being coordinated and worked through at the state level with our local partners which is a very, very nice compliment and a very critical compliment to what our local partners have implemented through their own planning and design as well. Um, and then we also have a new community provider grant program. As we all move into the fall, we know that um, an eye towards small providers, working with personal providers um, is really important. So we have the CalVax grant program um, that's currently running into mid-August. We're looking at potentially extending that deadline. It's intended to help support practices um, to set their offices as small community-based um, COVID vaccination sites. Um, as we know, we move towards uh, the younger age groups being vaccinated. We, we wanna make sure we have that resource in place at the community level. And then we also have um, vaccine verification across public and private sectors that we're, we're starting to monitor and also um, know that is taking place. Um, some ones to highlight are state of California employees and healthcare workers as part, and we'll talk about in the next slide a little bit more, um, a requirement for vaccination verification in the workplace. We're also seeing cities also take on this at the local level, Los Angeles, Pasadena, San Francisco, and also private businesses, um, as many of you all here are probably familiar with and heard with such as Facebook, Google, Lyft, Microsoft, um, you know, and other ones such as Tyson Foods, Uber, Disney, Walmart, um, and, and so on and so forth. So definitely a lot of key interventions in play throughout the state um, that are uh, implemented and we continue to monitor. So moving on to the next slide here, um, wanted to give an update of where we are as of July 28th. Um, CDPH did issue guidance on face coverings, um, adds a recommendation for universal masking indoors statewide. Um, and also um, included um, certain facilities where all individuals must wear a mask. And it was also released as part of a state health officer order on July 26. Um, it must be worn by all unvaccinated indoor public. So this is the state order and this is, this is what covers all states. Certainly local jurisdictions can be more restrictive. Um, and then the fully vaccinated uh, masking in this order is, is optional except in um, the areas identified below, public transportation, uh, childcare, K through 12, youth settings, emergency shelters, cooling centers. Um, and then there is a recommendation for surgical mask in healthcare settings. Um, as of August 4th, uh, we've been tracking that there are jurisdictions that have implemented um, more restrictive um, measures than the state health order and listed there on the bottom there, Los Angeles, Sacramento, Yolo, Santa Barbara, and of course, many of the Bay Area counties here. 
Um, so uh, we continue to monitor and work with our local partners um, as they explore um, what is uh, most conducive and feasible for them. Um, we have a very strong partnership with all of our local jurisdictions to share data that is locally specific. Um, and so we know that that has a lot to go into any local determination. So I wanted to move into um, the uh, kind of like a little glimpse of um, you know, the good news here is that, you know, we did see a uh, certainly a, a high uptick in vaccines administered back in March and April, especially when there was scarcity. And then, of course, it went down. Um, the good news is that um, in the last several weeks, we've started to see an uptick again. Um, and not only have we seen an uptick um, in first doses being administered, um, but we've also seen that in the Bay Area, over 80% of people 12 and older have at least one dose, and that is the highest of all the regions in the state. So um, certainly a lot of really good work happening in the Bay Area. So, um, what this was really just a reminder for me here that as these slides are being shared out to the wider group, um, it will comprise of various resources um, for businesses um, with regards to um, resources and implementation of um, different criteria. So just wanted to flag that for you all that um, that will be available to you and also was shared in previous presentations. Thank you so much, Carolyn. That was a, a wonderful run through of an enormous amount of information, which already has generated so many questions in our Q&A box. And to, to remind people, those questions should keep coming in. What I'd like to do next, uh, since Carolyn has sort of set the stage across the state for us, is now turn over to Dr. Gandhi. Uh, and Monica, I think you, you have uh, some prepared slides for the group before we get into a, a wider discussion and Q&A with the rest of the group. So Dr. Gandhi, can I turn it over to you? Yes, thank you. Um, am I able to share my screen? Because when I'm pushing that that button, it's not allowing me to do that. Sorry about that. Sure, we'll give you. Uh, Someone can just ensure oh, they can. Capability. Yeah, thank you. Oh, okay. Yes, it looks like I can. Good. Uh, looks like I can do it now. Okay, thank you. Um, so I actually was going to talk about the vaccines um, and just give you a little idea of um, the the immune response that we get to the vaccines. Um, try to, to to tell you why I think you know these vac the the variants Delta variant notwithstanding is not going to evade our vaccines, and also give you a sense of what's happening in the UK and the models that we're projecting here in the United States about when the Delta variant will, um, will subside. Uh, because certainly it's, a, it's an extremely transmissible variant um, and uh, has taken us all for a loop. Um, but something about a hurricane-like variant like um, Delta has al uh, can also subside quickly. So um, just to go through a little bit about the vaccines, just to remind us of you know, how many vaccine candidates we have out there. We really are Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson in terms of our EUA um, emergency use authorization approvals here in the United States. And to remind us all of how they work, um, really what they do is, um, I, the Johnson & Johnson is a DNA um, in, that encodes for a DNA containing virus uh, vaccine that encodes for the spike protein. And then as you know, the Pfizer and Moderna are both mRNA containing vaccines. But what they fundamentally do is make your body code for the spike protein. They give you the little bit of genetic material. You take that, you code for the spike protein, and then you raise a very vigorous immune response against the spike protein. And then if you ever see that virus again in the future, which of course has the spike protein, you are able to use your immunity and fight off that virus. And um, the, I'm only gonna stick with that because that's what we have in this country. But of course there are several other vaccine candidates that involve different designs of using the spike protein like Novavax, but they are not yet approved here. I wanted to tell you a little bit about immunology because I think it explains what's going on right now with the Delta variant. 
there are really two major arms of the immune system that you raise with your vaccine and that we, we all raise, um, whether we have natural infection or the vaccine against any infection. And um, they, those are essentially divided into B cells and T cells. And it's really the B cells that produce antibodies. And you hear a lot about antibodies because they're easy to measure. There are many papers on them, but um, because they're easier to measure, but actually we ignore or don't talk enough about the T cell immunity that is generated by all of these vaccines. And T cell immunity is important because data from um, UCSF and multiple other places shows that a good T cell response is what protects you from severe disease in the future if you ever see the virus again. Antibodies can wane, that's not abnormal, that's actually normal, it's not a glitch of the immune system. Antibodies can wane over time after getting the vaccine, but they luckily have a blueprint to make new antibodies, and those are what are called the B cells or memory B cells. T cells don't wane, they actually have a very long half-life after vaccination and after natural infection, and T cells are the main arm in the immune system that protect you against severe disease. It's why we're seeing such good holdout, even against the Delta variant of all the vaccines protecting strongly against severe disease. So um, this is more technical, so I won't go into this, but there's many, many articles and many descriptions of how our T cells protect us against severe disease with SARS-CoV-2. The reason that I show this busy slide is to remind us in the fourth column here of the Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson vaccine trials, that we, these are the three vaccines we have in this country, that they didn't just measure antibody responses. They took the time, they took the technicality using big flow cytometry machines and showed us that a very strong T cell response is raised against uh, the, uh, with these vaccines against the virus. And it's important uh, to keep on remembering about that T cell response when we go into, I think, what's happening with the Delta variant with, with more mild breakthroughs. You can see that in this yellow column, um, in the clinical trials for all the vaccines, not just the ones we have in this country, it was truly 100% protection. It was sort of you know, shocking to see such a high number. There was only one person in the Moderna trial who got hospitalized and they came out quickly. In the clinical trials, at least, there was 100% protection against hospitalization and death for COVID. Anyone who ha was hospitalized or had COVID uh, unfortunate death was in the placebo arm of these trials. There was variability, however, across the variants with mild disease. And we're gonna talk about that when we get to the antibody response to Delta. Um, this just shows you that this is true actually, even of the, 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 the vaccines we don't have in this country, which are the Covaxin product and the two products from um, uh, China. Okay, so, um, so will the vaccines work against the variants? Will they always work against the variants? It depends on what you decide is your definition of work. In terms of protecting us against severe disease, which is the entire reason that we even noticed COVID-19, otherwise it would have been another circulating coronavirus, absolutely they do protect us against so as you know, we've seen these kind of parade of variants. Um, they used to be named after the places they came from, then they were named um, numerically, and now we have them being called Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, and the Delta variant is the one that we're concerned of right now. June 15th, when we opened here in California, things were looking very rosy, and unfortunately, the Delta variant came. And um, it had originated in India in March. We saw a terrible surge of infections and death in India because they had such low rates of vaccination. They went to Israel. We're still seeing increased cases. Hospitalizations are staying more low because they have higher rates of vaccination. Same thing with the UK, more uniformly high rates of vaccination. Lots and lots of cases with Delta. Hospitalizations, because they had higher rates of vaccination than we did, stayed generally low, meaning much different than we would have seen if we didn't have vaccination. The hospitalizations would attract with cases. And then here in this country, what are we seeing? We're seeing a mixture of both. We're seeing places like Arkansas, we're seeing places like Florida that show that there are lower rates of vaccination and hospitalizations are tracking more with cases like they used to in the bad times. And in places that are more highly vaccinated, even like California, even though obviously we need to do better, um, we're seeing it, the, the hospitalizations are not tracking with cases in the same way. There's more of a decoupling um, and hospitalizations are mainly among the unvaccinated. And that data is quite clear, um, both from the CDC level, from LA County level, from San Francisco and here in California, that a majority of those who are in the hospital are unvaccinated. 
So the reason why I want to convince you that I don't think a vaccine can evade, um, a variant can evade our vaccines, including the Delta variant, is to be a little complex and tell you about the T cell response, but I'm going to explain it really simply. Essentially, if you have a spike protein, which is what you made um, from your vaccine, uh, across the entire spike protein, to put it simply, there are basically 100 T cells that line up across that spike protein to fight that virus. Uh, Delta variant, alpha, any of them have about 10 to 13 mutations. So they will knock off some of those T cells, um, maybe 13 of them, and but you still have 87 that line up across there and give you protection against the variants. How do we know that? Well, there's data from both the La Jolla Immunology Institute in San Diego. There's also data from up here at UCSF, at the Gladstone Institute, from our own institution that shows that across the variants, even with Delta, the T cell immune response is equally robust um, against the Delta variant as it was with the ancestral strain. So at least in terms of protecting you against severe disease, um, which is what T cells do, we are seeing preserved protection against severe disease, even with the Delta variant. And the other piece of data that I wanna tell you that would be related to that, and then I'll come back to this and I'll come back to transmission, is that memory B cells. So I told you that we had T cells and we have memory B cells. Remember the memory B cells will produce antibodies and those antibodies will go down with time. Anyone who was vaccinated in January, like me, um, a healthcare worker, I have lower antibodies in my nose than I did in February and March. And that is making us, and that's not a glitch. That is, again, not a problem with the immune system. That's what the immune system does. It will lower, our antibodies will lower because if we had kept all the antibodies in our bloodstream that we had seen of every infection of every vaccine, our blood would be as thick as paste. It can't hold all those antibodies. So it's a natural response for the immune system to lower your antibodies, for those to wane, because they have the blueprint. And what's the blueprint? It's called memory B cells. What memory B cells do, and we know we have memory B cells against the vaccines because there's been a study on nature that they actually biopsy people who had the vaccine, took their lymph nodes and saw in their lymph nodes nice formation at three, four, six, seven weeks after um, even one dose of the vaccines formation of what are called germinal centers of memory B cells. True in natural infection as well, they actually took bone marrow biopsies and saw memory B cell formation. What do memory B cells do? They are your parent cell that will produce more antibodies if you see the virus. It may take a couple of days, which is why we are seeing more mild breakthrough infections with the Delta variant, which is why we put back masks, which is prudent because we don't want mild breakthrough infections among the vaccinated. And that was the right thing to do. Um, but but it will take a couple of days for the antibodies to come out and then they will fight that infection from memory B cells and T cells were already there. And importantly, one final thing I wanna say about memory B cells is there's a paper from OHSU and there's a paper from uh, the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene just two days ago that show us that when memory B cells produce those antibodies when they see the virus again, they don't produce antibodies to the variant strain um, from circulating six months ago they actually adapt the antibodies to fight the variant that's in front of them. These are not different virals, virals, uh, uh, viruses. They're just some mutations along the um, spike protein. And they are able, if they produce new antibodies, to adapt their antibodies uh, towards that variant. That, that combination of data of T cell immunity lining up against the spike protein, memory B cells being able to produce antibodies that are directed against the variants is why I don't think unless we get a very terrible variant, they're going to evade our vaccines. And there is no evidence that Delta is evading our vaccine. Why do we know that Delta isn't evading our vaccines? Because we've actually tested it, unfortunately. Um, so uh, the country opened up in London, in England, um, when the Delta variant was highly circulating, it was July 19th when they opened up. And they continually show us analysis that in England, in the UK, there's still 96 six protections. 6% protection against severe disease. Again, about 99% of people in the hospital in this country are those who are unvaccinated eligibles. Um, and the variability across symptomatic disease, even getting mild infection, um, likely has to do with our waning antibodies over time since we've gotten our vaccines. And that's why, why we still have Delta circulating, putting back the mask for the vaccinated is very prudent. Um, one thing I wanna say on this question 
of can you equally transmit the virus if you're vaccinated versus unvaccinated with the Delta variant? I don't think you can, though I think we're seeing more symptomatic breakthroughs and you can transmit it when you're symptomatically, uh, when you're symptomatic with a mild infection with the Delta Prior to the Delta variant, there were lots of studies that swabbed the noses of people who had been vaccinated and found that asymptomatic infection, getting even any ability for it to get in your nose, was drastically reduced in the case of the Alpha variant, and in some cases, the Beta. Unfortunately, the Delta variant has changed that equation. And um, this data from Provincetown last week, which got a lot of attention, I think I learned two things from the Provincetown. Number one, is that this was a, a group of mainly um, men who have sex with men that descend on uh, uh, Provincetown uh, over July 4th. It's a yearly festival, it's very fun, um, but uh, there was a lot of exposure and there was a lot of exposure inside. It was raining that week, windows weren't open, a lot of intimacy, lots of exposure. And the reason we call this a stress test of the vaccine is that probably among 800 people who had Delta virus, um, who were a Delta strain, who were um, vaccinated, there were three hospitalizations and they were released very quickly from the hospital. So that incredible staying power of the vaccines to protect against severe disease is why the interpretation is that was a stress test for the vaccines and really showed how well they stand up um, for, se for severe outcomes. In terms of mild symptomatic breakthroughs, this is not an emblematic activity, meaning this is not probably generalizable to a typical uh, having dinner with your friends or being in the office um, all vaccinated. There was no masking. There was a lot of a lot of lot of physical intimacy, and um, so that's why I think generalizing it to what is going to happen when we open up businesses, it, it's not right to generalize it from this. And then importantly. Um, there was a study the next day in uh, published from Singapore that showed that those uh, who are vaccinated and unvaccinated with the Delta variant do start with the same viral load, which is very disappointing. That's what we saw in the Provincetown data. But luckily, they did serial testing in the Singapore study um, with people that had the Delta breakthrough infections, symptomatic breakthrough infections, and the viral load came down very quickly, which, of course, makes sense because your immune response does fight it and it does bring it down. So no, I don't believe vaccinated people are as infectious as unvaccinated people, even with the Delta variant, but when they are symptomatic, they can pass it. Um, not as readily, but they can pass it. And that really has again led back to our masks coming back on. So um, I wanna actually end there and uh, say one final thing. Uh, there, are, there were four models presented in Medscape and I meant to put this up as a slide but I couldn't transfer over the pictures in time. So I will do that in a minute when, during the question time of when is the Delta variant going to subside in the United States? Um, it, the only way that we can extrapolate anything is from looking at other countries that are ahead of us. Six to seven weeks ahead of us was the UK. Higher rates of vaccination to be sure. Um, and uh, even though some UK rates, of course, were equivalent to places in this country like Vermont, we're still lower than um, the vaccination rates they've achieved in the UK here in California. And, um, and cases started plummeting around uh, July 26th. And they keep on going down, they keep on going down. So there was a series of predictive models yesterday in Medscape from four different groups that show that our Delta variant surge if we model it after what happened in the UK, we'll go down by mid to late September, that we're peaking, we're peaking in August, and then it will start coming down mid to late September. So when we think about our openings and what's going on, know that like all of, all of these terrible surges that they do come down and what the California state just described in terms of increasing our vaccination state is very admirable and what California is doing to increase vaccination and uptick and so is the whole country, um, is, is extremely helpful. And right now, yesterday, there were 834,000 doses administered across the country um, of the vaccine. We have seen a profound uptick in vaccination since the Delta. It's been about uh, tw first 25% and then last week, 30% uptick in vaccinations. So I'm hoping we're getting through. Thank you, I will stop there. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Gandhi. What a, what a thorough uh, reminder of what our immune system does for us to keep us safe, and we really appreciate your taking the time to do that. Um, you know, I'm glad you mentioned the, uh, the vaccine, uh, the push across the state. And um, we at Sutter Health, we just um, announced our mandatory vaccination for everybody, just like you at the UCs did um, a few weeks back. 
And I think several, um, several healthcare organizations across the state are doing so. So this is the way we want to, to fight this. Um, Completely agree. Yep. So uh, I think we're going to have now Dr. Kurtz also join us. And I'd like to um, run through the uh, questions and answers um, from both our audience, as well as some that I think we've discussed in advance. Um, so first of all, let's start with you, Dr. Kurtz. Um, you know, we're hearing a lot about state cases. Uh, is this, does the state have a way to track those people who were vaccinated who might have acquired disease but have not been hospitalized? Is there a method for that? Uh, so, I mean, if, if they're, they're tested, I mean, that data is reported into the system. And so we, we do, do track that data. And that is something that um, local health jurisdictions, um, as requested, can access that as well. Great. Monica, there's a, a real scientifically oriented person here. You mentioned that the, uh, the memory cells can adapt to new versions of the virus. And so why do we have to get revaccinated for influenza every year? Why don't they remember yeah. that one? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So um, they are really profoundly different viruses. So uh, they're both RNA viruses, influenza and coronavirus. Um, but Influenza virus has something we call a very leaky polymerase and it mutates very, very rapidly. And by the way, it doesn't have one spike protein, it has two. Um, so that's, you know, when you say HN1, N1 or H9, N9, I mean, these are really the, the H and the N spike proteins. And um, so lots more opportunities for those highly antigenically stimulated areas to, um, to, uh, uh, to mutate. So we really every year have to, figure out, not this last year, because there was a little, very little flu, but we had to figure out usually what were the circulating uh, flu strains and put that in the current vaccine. The coronavirus um, polymerase, uh, how it replicates itself, is not actually this mutagenic. It seems like this because we're seeing so much transmission in the world. Um, and unfortunately, we're seeing higher rates of transmission you know, worldwide in 2021 than we did in 2020 because of lack of global vaccine equity, unfortunately. But with a lot of transmission, it can mutate. But once we get this under control, it isn't leaky like, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't like to replicate, it likes to replicate with a more fastidious manner and keep its, its, viral, uh, its virus intact. And we won't see these levels of, of massive amounts of mutations on a yearly basis. We just gotta get this under control, which fundamentally, has to do with global vaccine equity. Thank you. Monica, I'm gonna follow up addressing this to you to start, but uh, maybe Carolyn will also wanna weigh in. You know, is there, a, is there an understudy virus waiting in the wings to replace the diva of Delta? Uh, is, is Lambda going to come in and take over the show here? You know, there are other variants, Delta plus Lambda, but I pretty much think Delta is as bad as it gets in terms of transmissibility. It is actually hard to imagine um, that you can be as transmissible as Delta. And I think it did reach its kind of evolutionary peak. And I don't see another, I hope I've convinced you that I don't think they're gonna evade our vaccines, uh, a variant because of the uh, T cell immunity and also because of memory B cells being able to adapt. Um, but in terms of transmissibility, I really don't see something coming out that's worse than this. This was bad. And remember, if you mutate too much, and just to put it really cleanly, like I think about this when I think about humans, uh, I'll, put, I'll use a funny example. But like if I mutate a, um, uh, a hand on my head, then I can't wear a hat. Like there are fitness costs for, <laughs> for too much mutation. And so we learned this from HIV and all other viruses. You can't keep on mutating indefinitely because there will be other costs to the virus. And so the smartest thing a virus can do for its own evolutionary adaptation is become more and more transmissible so it can get to more people. But it's actually not smart for a virus to become more deadly because it kills its host and like Ebola. And that isn't the smartest way for a virus in an evolutionary sense to keep on going. So it's not going to likely become you know, trans, more transmissible, suddenly evade our vaccines and more virulent all at the same time. It's very difficult for a small genome of a virus to evolve that many mutations. I think we've seen, I hope we've seen the worst of it with Delta. We've just got to get through this. Carolyn, I have a question for you. Um, you know, Monica convinced us that 
well, I don't know, after, after what we've all been through for almost a year and a half, I don't know if I'm going to live another 90 years, but there might be some memory cells alive 90 years from now. Um, what's the state planning, if anything, to, uh, to mandate vaccinations for everybody so that healthcare systems don't have to take this on? You know, I think where we're at right now is, um, you know, we're recommending it, we're encouraging it. Um, you know, we've provided guidance um, for certain settings um, where, you know, there could be some criteria for um, vaccine verification. Um, you know, the, we put that in the state health order that I just shared today. Um, there was a question that was in the chat about, you know, is it going to be moving to something more restrictive? We're continuously evaluating um, the data and, you know, as we see the fit to update, um, especially in the healthcare setting, um, we're going to do so. I think that that is the one area that we're watching very closely um, to determine whether or not a mandate or something more um, uh, strict may come down. But at the same time, we are absolutely uh, from a public health perspective, supportive of local jurisdictions, making that determination um, based on the data that they see. Thanks, Karen. You know, if I could just jump in here, um, cause you just said 90 years. So I do wanna say one thing about 90 years yeah. is what you're referring to. Um, this was quite an amazing study that showed us the 90 year, what um, you know, Dr. Eisenberg was just mentioning is that um, if you get B memory B cell formation, uh, your those memory B cells can last a, literally 90 years. And how do we know that is because there was um, people who were infected with the influenza 1918 strain who were three to 10 years old at the time. And then 90 to, 100, 90 to 95 years later, they took them. They were now ranging between 98 and 101 years old. They had 34 people. And in a nature study, they showed that their memory cells that they had formed 90 years earlier could be stimulated readily to produce and neutralizing antibodies against the 1918 strain and um, you know, protect mice, for example, from infection with those neutralizing antibodies. So your immune system is amazing and it can last those 90 years. And I will say um, in terms of vaccine mandates, uh, there is also, as you know, from an infectious disease perspective, precedent in this country and a Supreme Court ruling in this country from 1905. It's called Jacobson versus Massachusetts. And um, this was a time in our country when smallpox vaccination, could, um, people were not uptaking it. About 30% of people were declining it. And so there was a uh, Supreme Court ruling that eventually went from someone who said, I don't wanna get vaccinated. And, um, and the Supreme Court has upheld the right for compulsory mandated required vaccination in the United States from that 1905 ruling. So I wanna put that out there, Caroline, when you are thinking about <laughs> the, the hard work that we have to do to think about um, you know, our, our country and our state going towards words like vaccine passports, vaccine mandates. Everything has sort of shifted in the last three weeks to go towards those words. Thanks, Dr. Gandhi. I have, a, I have a question that came up in the chat, and I think maybe it was Emily Webb that first posed it, but there have been some riffs on it. it has to do with, um, should we be contemplating a booster dose? And what about a third dose for immunocompromised people? And what if I got J&J, &J? should I get an mRNA vaccine? Do either one of you or both of you wanna weigh in on that one? So right now the state's position is um, following what is part of the EUA um, approval. And so at this time that is not part of the EUA approval for um, a booster or an additional dose. Um, and, you know, that is the position that we're going to be taking until otherwise directed from a, a regulatory standpoint. Thanks for that. Monica, you and I both have hospitals where we have transplant services. What do you think about yes. that? Yeah, right. So, you know, I think biologically, when you think about boosters for immunocompetent patients, I agree that um, from the, what I just presented to you, that your memory T cells are formed really well, your memory B cells are formed really well, and you should have long-term protection, immunocompetent. What are the populations that we have always considered boosters for and give very frequently out in infectious disease? And it is the immunocompromised patient population and also elderly patients with multiple medical conditions. It's why we give, for example, double the dose of the flu vaccine for elderly patients, because we want to really stimulate that immune response and with immunocompromised, we want to as well. So the FDA and the CDC, and I think you can see these discussions since the ACIP meeting on June 23rd, is going towards this question of, of giving immunocompromised individuals a third shot. Um, and they have not decided yet. And I agree uh, with 
with Caroline that we that the state and all local jurisdictions should follow. I think a very carefully thought out process by the CDC and FDA, and it has to be added to the EUA because these are under emergency use authorization. But I do I think that it's coming? Yes, I do for immunocompromised um, or elderly patients with multiple medical conditions. When we look at the number of severe breakthrough infections in this country with SARS-CoV-2, it's still very low, even with the Delta variant, which is really a blessing out of 163 million Americans vaccinated. There is about 4,600 people, this is tracked closely, who've had severe breakthrough infections and had to be hospitalized. And we need um, we need to know the characteristics of those individuals if, in terms of immunocompromised elderly with medical conditions. They have looked at that in Israel and have decided to give a third shot for immunocompromised there. So it's going to happen. It's going to happen in that population. And I think it will happen relatively yeah, yeah. soon. And I and I would agree with Dr. Gandhi that directionally that would be you know the grouping that we would look most to in, right. in the effect of that subversion. So right. let's talk about another specialized group. I'm glad you both agree with that because boy, I'm I'm really champing at the bit for our transplant patients, especially. Um, so this one is another special population. What about kids? I mean, you mentioned the you know end of September, Monica, is when we think this is maybe going to start getting rid of this issue for us. But school is starting now, and kids, you know, um, they may not even know they've got a stuffy nose due to COVID, um, and yet they go see grandma and grandpa over the weekend. Um, so thoughts about expanding this to twelve and under. I mean, one thing I'll say about that before I talk about the expansion is that um, I do think our data from this country has really shown us convincingly that even prior to vaccination, that children can be safely back in school. And um, Wisconsin data, North Carolina data, Utah data, and I think that you know, the California DPH is also been very clear in messaging that. And, and when school starts with mitigation procedures like masks, for children and, and ventilation that we can still have our children in school. Um, and actually the education secretary just spoke about a half an hour ago um, from the President Biden administration and echoed that same word that the Biden administration very much supports return to in-person learning despite the Delta variant with safety procedures. So going back to children being vaccinated though, um, as you know, we have the EUA from 12 to 15 for Pfizer um, and uh, for kids. And that is a 30 microgram dose, which is um, the same that we use in adults. And what happened is that there was very mild um, uh, uh, increased rate of myocarditis in young males that were more seen after the second dose. So they went back to the two to 11 year olds and actually reevaluated the dosing and changed it from what they were gonna do, which was 10, 20 and 30 micrograms to three, 10 and 20 micrograms. And then about three weeks ago, the FDA said to Pfizer, you know what, we want you to expand your two to 11 year, um, your five to 11 year old group. They were originally planning on 2,265 kids in that group. And they said, just to make sure that there's not safety concerns, we would like you to go to 5,000 children in that group. And they said, absolutely, we're gonna do that. We have plenty of children who wanna be in the trials, but that will delay, that will delay when we get the final results for the five to 11 year olds. And what Pfizer has said is they used to say September and now they're saying mid-October. So we will have data, it will happen, it's happening, but they're doing it in the safest way possible. And I do think that we'll get an EUA for kids end of, end of more, more towards the later side of fall. Thanks. Carolyn, you want to weigh in on that one too, I guess. Well, I mean, I just, I couldn't say it better than Dr. Gandhi, you know, definitely support children being back in school. We have put extensive measures working in partnership with all of our um, stakeholders around what would create a safe space in this, with all the safety measures and the guidance out there. So um, first and foremost, I mean, given all of the concerns that are out there outside of schools, um, we do feel confident that um, we can have children safely back in school. Thank you. Um, Dr. Gandhi, questions about, um, does, does Delta cause sicker patients who get COVID? Are they as sick as some of the earlier strains? What's your thought on that? It's hard to sort out with vaccination as part of. You know, the reason it can be really hard to sort out is because, um, is because you're right, when cases go up, then hospitalizations go up among the unvaccinated. And so it's always been questioned, this happened with the alpha variant as well, is it more virulent or is it just that we're seeing more hospitalizations among the unvaccinated and that makes it look like they're sicker? 
There are some intimations that it could be more virulent. The CDC had that leaked Washington Post slide deck. Um, I don't know why it was leaked um, last week that indicated there could be possibly more virulence, more sick. I will tell you from personal, what we were reporting at our hospital is we're not actually seeing more sick, we're able to manage, but it seems that people get sick faster. Like if you get it on this day, you're more sick by the next day. Yeah. And um, we were commenting about that among our infectious disease group and wondering if that was because you had a higher amount of virus that came in. Um, so again, I'm not, I, I think the jury is still out on that one. And as we've all been talking about on the call, no one should be getting sick for coronavirus who's an adult. And uh, the, the fundamental thing I can think, anyone can think of is increase is getting people unvaccinated, vaccinated. Great, thanks. Well, and to, and to follow on with that, you know, there was a, a question from uh, Melanie Woodrow at ABC 7 News, and thanks for that question, Melanie. Do we have any understandings about why um, particular healthcare workers in the Bay Area have elected not to be vaccinated? I can say from our Sutter Health experience, um, you know, like, like everybody else, healthcare workers are people first, and they're healthcare workers second. People may have belief systems um, about vaccines, in general, um, and we honor people's beliefs, of course. On the other hand, science has to rule our decisions. The things that are most important for all of us, the, the speakers on this call right now, are to follow the science. I think Dr. Gandhi's laid out the rationale very clearly and succinctly why it's important. And so we have to help our coworkers who feel reluctant about this to understand the why. And it's why most healthcare systems, like ours, as I mentioned already, a really mandated vaccination. We wanna do the right thing for our patients. We want them to feel as safe as possible coming in and we wanna protect one another, right? I mean, we, we work with people who are our coworkers and we don't want them to get sick because we value them. They're our partners. They're the team members that care for our patients. So um, I, I doubt that, that either Monica or Carolyn would, would argue with those points. Monica, any special insights about why people are reluctant that you'd like to add to this? Yes, I mean, I, I've sort of, and Carolyn, Carol, Carol, I'd be really interested, like is California's different, but it seems like there's sort of five categories. And, and actually I'm really interested in the category that their mind can be changed, right? Like, so, and, and New York Times had a really nice article on this, but it was, there were just people who were waiting for the safety. Um, they just felt like, you know what, this is too new and I need to wait and I need to see more people get vaccinated. And there are people who are upticking with the vaccine after that. There are people who want the EUA to convert to an approval. That to them means something that you don't have to sign a consent form when you get it. And I don't think I could see any more pressure on an organization than I've seen on the FDA over the last month saying, please approve these vaccines. Um, number three is there's min misinformation. We all know that they, this misinformation can appear very convincing online. There can be like scientists and doctors um, saying things that are that are inaccurate actually, but they are, they are up there and they're saying it. And Vivek Murthy, the Surgeon General, cracking down on misinformation and, and cracking down on tech companies that allow that misinformation there, I think, was a very right approach. And then there are people who are naturally infected and they're not sure they need the vaccine. And I actually think that's a very fair point of contention that we all need to come to grapples with because there are places in the world that don't, don't say that you need a vaccine after natural infection or you need one dose. So I think we have to come out and admit that and talk about natural immunity. And then... Um, and then there are people where it's just political. And uh, there I feel like if, if our Republican leaders, uh, which they have been, um, could be more helpful uh, uh, as, they, as they have been, they've been, Fauci's like come out and talk uh, or and President Biden on Monday said, if you're not gonna you know, talk to your constituents about getting vaccinated, please stay out of our way. Yeah, I, I would add from our experience, um, you know, we're at a point now where yeah. those that wanted to get vaccinated got it. And then we're working with um, a group that has a very wide array of reasons as Dr. Gandhi laid out. And what we have found in the last couple of months when we've put a lot of energy and focus and working very closely with uh, what we considered our priority counties that con constituted 86% of the population that's unvaccinated, that it was very small changes that took a lot of work. As I mentioned earlier, you know, there was a 
um, four different levers and a combination of different levers for different types of geographies and groups. And we found that it was really the slow game. It was really like being on the ground and really moving people through, trying to determine what was it that actually was causing them to not take the vac vaccine. Um, and we found that it was a very, very wide array of mix that actually got people to take the vaccine. And you know, even so some of those examples that we found were, um, I would say some like really good wins, even though they were small numbers, was identifying um, conservative voices that, you know, could um, message, um, putting out a rural toolkit that actually had things that resonate with those groups. Um, you know, we talk about incentives, but then the timing of the incentives actually mattered. If someone got something immediately, then that was actually more, more likely to sway them than to, to actually say something was going to come later on. So there was a wide array of things, um, the trusted messengers, the grouping of the trusted messengers, and the timing in which messaging came, we found like in rural dispersed populations that you had to message more often than in like more dense populations where you could put out a message and, and people knew and they came. So it's just, I really think where we're at now is that we're working with a smaller group of the of the population that is harder. It is going to be slower. Um, it just means we have to like stay the course. And so that's why to the me, this is the hard work, right? It is. You are saying it is. this is this is the hard work that no one size fits all community based messaging going yep. into different communities who had distrust of our government, which is understandable. And it is the hard work. Mm hmm. And you guys, it, yeah. it is. It's that's why the local and state combination of a statewide intervention is really key. You know, get the air coverage and the local, the local groundwork, and it needs to be both to really be a statewide intervention. So I want to. Um, I'd like to close with uh, with one final question here, um, and it, 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 you know, we've talked a little bit about um, and reinforced how many of our healthcare systems have been mandating vaccination. But I also want to acknowledge that there are many businesses that are following suit as well. Carolyn, you mentioned that. Uh, and one of our questioners, uh, James McGowey, if I pronounced your name right, says that um, his, his company has mandated vaccination. And he's also self-confessed that he really actually likes going to work. He doesn't like to work from home. And so he's wondering, um, do we think that we're going to have to start closing things down again? Uh, I think, you know, people that do enjoy being with one another. I mean, we're all adults. We like that social interaction. Do we anticipate there's going to be closures again? You know, where, where we're at right now with the state and the different messaging and guidance is, is really more in a harm reduction mode right now. And so, um, you know, if we're able to, if businesses are able to bring people back together safely and follow those measures, you know, we're those those are what we're going to support right now. Um, you know, we we made a decision on June fifteenth, given the certain criteria, the the supply of vaccine being plentiful, um, that you know we would open up California's economy. And so um, right now we're very focused on looking at the mixture of risk that is out there and what are the different harm reduction measures that we could employ. Great. I, I would really like to add to that, which is that um, you know the, the the Israel is is using a strategy called soft suppression. We have a whole name for it. Um, and their soft suppression strategy is actually what you just described, uh, Caroline, in terms of harm reduction because of the impacts of on schools and children and everything else that we had uh, with the lockdowns. And so they're using masks inside. Um, they are boosting immunocompromised and they are doing vaccine passports, which I think the state has to, just like New York City decided two days ago, um, has to, I, I do think they have to come down on that uh, or cities or jurisdictions have to decide about vaccine passports. But those are their three ways um, that they're working. It's called soft suppression and they are not planning on locking down. Wonderful. Well, you know, I, I hate to say, but we're at the end of our time. I mean, gosh, we've filled this up and while there were plenty more questions we could have answered, we have, uh, we've consumed all of our time right now. I really wanna thank um, both Dr. Gandhi and Dr. Kurtz for sharing their mornings with us. I think Dr. Gandhi, in fact, is, is doing it uh, at part of her vacation time. So thank you so much for doing that. This um, is my last talk, though, for vacation. It was very, uh, very happy. Oh, good, good. <laughs> well, it, we, I think we know that uh, Dr. Gandhi is, is well-educated, having read all those books. I'm sure she has in her background there. So uh, <laughs> we really appreciate all of that. And I do want to thank all of you, uh, you members of the, um, of the Bay Area Council for joining us today. And please, um, please stay tuned because we really plan on doing any of these off-cycle healthcare meetings for you because we want to keep you well informed. You, 
you are the engine that runs the Bay Area and we wanna keep you healthy and happy. So have a great day, everybody. And thanks again for joining. Thank you. Thank you.